Um, you've been an investigative journalist, I suppose. I guess you could call it that. Yeah. <laughs> we don't go, I mean, we have some friends who are real investigative journalists, like Terry Buell or Leah McGrath Goodman, who mm -hmm. go out and find all these documents and stuff. We're investigative, well, we have opinions. We have investigative opinion makers. Mm -hmm. Do you have any tips for anyone aspiring to kind of follow in your footsteps? Um, well, it, I think it just has to do with curiosity and wanting, you know, th th how we started was I was already working in media and I met Max Kaiser and he told me stories that I, I believed to be untrue <laughs> about his, his past as a banker and I thought that can't possibly be true. And sure enough, I started reading the Financial Times and they talked about it mm -hmm. openly. And I was shocked that they were writing about this and I thought I had made a big discovery. I thought that was investigative journalism. <laughs> Look, they're reporting about this in a financial paper. Um, so I think just, you know, be curious and keep on looking and, and you know, have an opinion, mm -hmm. I guess. Do you feel that there's a human nature? Um, or rather, do you, do you, are you of this school of thought that believes that these types of t tyrannical people and these people involved in oppressive regimes are born, and not necessarily born that way, but genetically encouraged in a way that... Well, I... My reading of history is it does happen over and over where we have kings or emperors or pharaohs. I think it's, a, it's not just those individuals. I think it's the society itself. The people themselves seem to like these sort of people. And I think a lot of it has to do with the, the psychopathy. And those people tend to be very charming and uh, alluring and very confident in their view of the world and and you know project confidence so I think that's perhaps what happens over and over you know a, a lot of people don't like to have to uh, you know engage and think and, and, and struggle every day with big ideas they just want to get up have their breakfast go to work yeah. and not think and I think into that sort of vacuum. But I think, yeah, I, I do think power does corrupt. I think anybody, even the most perfect, well-meaning human being, eventually in that role, given all that power by the population who wants them to decide for them. I mean, environmental thing, isn't it? Environmental. Like, if they're thrust into that role, the way people yeah. are treating you and the will influence the way that you start to interact with your surroundings. Sure, and it becomes kind of genetic in a way in that it's passed down. So, you know, one, say Tony Blair, okay, he didn't grow up in a powerful family ruling, but his children have, and they have a sense of entitlement that perhaps Blair didn't have as a youngster. And, you know, perhaps he, he was obviously striving for power, and he was a magnetic personality in terms of delivering his speech. It was pure psychopathy, but people fell for him over and over. I was living here, and I just could not believe the, the you know, passion he, the people had for him and went out and voted for him. And it was, you could see that he would win every time in debate and con in uh, parliament, and you could see he was, you know, it was all lies, but he was telling it so convincingly yeah. that people just voted for him. But now his children, you know, they become more mediocre because they don't have the struggle to yeah. rise to power. They are just in, born into power. And that's when all the his sickness starts to really develop. What, and you were speaking of when you first kind of made your, um, was, how did you put it, like your journalistic discovery or what you felt that was at the time? A lot of the time you were confronted with the same sort of stories that Max Kaiser would have been telling you. I remember when I first met Blake, it was a similar sort of thing, and I, I was shocked. What was it, um, or can you even put your finger on it, that um, sort of allowed you to take that in, and to be brave about that, and be like, okay, I will investigate into this aspect of reality that's uncomfortable for me, and that will necessitate me to make changes in how I interact with my 
surrounding. Well, luckily, I, I had lived outside of the U.S. for a very long time. I moved to London in my early 20s, and I'm an outsider here, so I never cared who was Labour or Tory. So I, I think I, I don't really have any sort of hard-coded propaganda. Uh, there are, in, when I go to America and visit my family, it's very partisan. They're either Democrats or Republicans. And it, even on my Facebook page, which is just mostly my family, you can see my dad's family is all Republican and my mom's family is all <laughs> Democrat. And if they could only see each other writing, I mean, th they don't actually talk. but. It's just funny, like, hardcore, like, hating Romney or hating Obama. And, hate, and I, so I don't have any of that, you know, I wasn't tied to any particular thing. And I certainly didn't have an opinion about financial markets at that point. So I was just open to what it is, the reality that Max was presenting to me. Um, so I didn't have any preconceived notion, really, other than, like, when he, uh, other than the fact about crime. You know, when he was talking about the open crimes, I thought, surely there's a justice system and they would be, they wouldn't do this. Certainly not somebody like Lloyd Blankfein or Jamie Dimon, their CEO. How would they do that? Because they would be marginalized once they get thrown in jail. Yeah. But... It doesn't work out that way, mm. sadly. You have a project up on part of my film. Um, I forget the title of it now. Uh, Where's Kenny Boy? Where's Kenny Boy? <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about the project? I'd love to see that get funded. Yeah, um, well, I came up with that idea when it was, well, it was quite obvious that there were some dodgy things regarding Ken Lay dying. He had basically been prosecuted, found guilty, under the same thing that John Gotti, the, um, you know, the mafia boss in New York, was found guilty of. So, all I had to do was picture John Gotti dying in the middle of the night out in, in uh, Colorado somewhere and uh, the bizarre circumstances of his autopsy yeah. so his body uh, Ken Lay's body was never observed by the Department of Justice which would have demanded to see any body of John Gotti had he died in the middle of the night you can't just cremate him and just like get rid of his body um, to take him out and throw him in the sea or something. yeah so I thought just even for fun you know where is where is Kenny boy like where, where did he go and I, that same month he died, the Bush family bought a one million acre uh, land in Paraguay, in northern Paraguay, near the U.S. Um, military base there. So I thought, well, you know, I'm just imagining, I don't know where he is, I, you know, I, I'm not making up the story as it is. I'm just saying, you know, I, I would like to go and speak to, you know, people who, who, who do have to perform autopsies for the Department of Justice and what, what would the standard procedure be if a, a gangster or a guy who's just been sent what, what was about to be sentenced to decades behind bars what, wouldn't the Department of Justice want to see the body if they died in the middle of the night so we were going to Al Jazeera English wanted to make that with us but um, I had some sources who said it would be very dangerous because there were high-level people involved. So it was a guy who knows what he's talking about, and he said, uh, you know, you're going to be, these are high-level politicians and stuff if there is a, some sort of cover-up. So the Al Jazeera was like, well, we'll send um, some SAS, former SAS guys with you. Um, then, then, oh, God. <laughs> yeah, they, they really wanted to send us, and then I got very really worried. Uh, yeah. for Max's safety and stuff so I kind of um, put it on the back burner but now now that he's you know Bush is out of power and perhaps he really is dead by now because he was an older guy anyway <laughs> I don't know yeah. can you uh, explain um, a little bit about part of my film perhaps and about how that works well, Pirate My Film led me to Bitcoin, that's why I'm here. Is I financed some films through there, Hotspots Greece, Hotspots Ireland, and, well, you know, my background is in Hollywood. I worked in Hollywood for the producer who made Taxi Driver and Close Encounters and this thing. So I've always worked in film and television. Um, but, so I, I, Max's idea is that Pirate My Film, and he had worked, he had built hsx.com. So we, we kind of had, you know, the, the backgrounds really meet in Pirate My Film. 
and I um, listed some projects there and that was collected in, in PayPal which was just a nightmare. It was a uh, it it took a lot of the money so I hadn't really factored in the amount of money that it takes from PayPal plus a lot of people are just I guess trolling yeah you know, because they just charge back after it like 45 days or something they just charge back before you've even finished the project so you wonder yeah. like why did they take the five bucks back but it uh, it puts a negative mark on your account yeah. and so they could block you out just because some jerk trolling you yeah. about you know so, but it seemed like an obvious flaw in the system I, I was wondering how people even develop small businesses because there are always going to be jerks who are just out there lonely in their bedrooms and just do things like this for fun, just like charge back and you go, okay, what was the point of that? Um, so when Bit then we, you know, I forget exactly where I first heard of Bitcoin, but... I remember seeing uh, Max Tukey in one of your, in one of the Kaiser reports yeah. about you were up on your original position, I guess that's yeah, yeah. the thing that's going Yeah, well, I, yeah, I, I got some at two dollars, but... Uh, you know that's another thing a lot of people treat it as a pure speculation and it's very hard you know people are brainwashed into a mindset of our modern world of speculating on everything whether it's flipping your house or flipping that and you can't like people shout and screech on our site about you know the speculative aspect of it which I never I didn't know <laughs> until I transferred Max like half of my thing so he could buy some uh, you know, um, pirate my film, and I, and he was like, "Oh, good, it's you, like now it's thirteen dollars <laughs> exchange rate." It was like, I didn't even know. I don't, yeah. I don't look at those prices. I don't look at silver. I don't look at gold mm -hmm. prices. I don't really know where it's going day to day or week to week. Yeah. Um, I know maybe at the end of the year, like I'll check once or twice a year and yeah. say, "Oh, okay." But commodities, just not your bag. No, it's just, it's just about, um, you know, the ease of, of transacting mm. and when I'm not transacting online you know when I post a film on pirate my film I prefer to be paid in Bitcoin yeah. the whole back end is easy I can see who paid and it's all set up for us there and you know you could transfer it into euro or, uh, or pound or dollars instantly so that's what I did paid the cameraman paid you know it's it was just easy yeah. it was so much easier it's so hard to even compare the two. It's like climbing Mount Everest is dealing with PayPal and then just strolling down to Tottenham Court Road is the other process. Yeah. I get the impression from, um, I'm quite a frequent uh, watcher, viewer of uh, the Kaiser Report, that um, you and Max uh, perceive um, our current socioeconomic system as being this uh, it was a gross perversion of capitalism. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts? Well, I think we're kind of beyond all of that. If you, again, look at history, you know, I think we're at one of those points where it's just everything will change and who knows what er erupts in there. I, I'm, not, I'm not so big on these ideologies, whether it's capitalism or socialism or various strains of economics. It's just Every sing as soon as you set them down, that's when law everything starts being broken anyway because somebody figures a way to manipulate it to their advantage. Yeah, enforce an ideology in yeah. the name to enforce an yeah. ideology it doesn't even make grammatical sense, really. Exactly, and I think most people who support ideologies, whether it's the guy selling the socialist worker outside various social forums or the guy selling, you know, uh, Austrian school outside a, a libertarian forum, they they like whatever benefits they think them and so it, they're all shouting at each other various phrase words that only they understand uh, whereas like the reality keeps on going on and I think you have to think about what the reality will be who knows once this whole system collapses I don't know it's hard to predict I mean when a, a lot of our these ideologies are based on two periods of time one during the late 18th century when the idea of divine right of kings was disappearing and the enlightenment was saying you know man can control their own destiny the individual could that created america and france and as we know it western europe and then you had the collapse of the Russian Empire and the Austria-Hungary Empire around the same time. 
and thousands, millions of peasants suddenly erupted in a different way. You know, they, they didn't have the same sort of system in place when the divine right of kings in Western Europe was falling apart, and they went a little bit bonkers <laughs> with, with, with Bolshevism and crazy stuff. But who knows? Like, now we have a system which is, you know, also has ingrained equally a different sort of oligarchy. Well, we have oligarchies, and when it falls apart, and I think it will, um, uh, who knows what is going to erupt because of Asia or Latin America or the Middle East. You know, they have different ideas and different ways of living. And the thing I'm worried about most, actually, is all the religious fundamentalism, which is more dangerous than even, I think, than the... Uh, economic fundamentalisms. They're strangely interlinked. Yeah. They? yeah. Well, I think they do work together. I yeah. think you see that in the U.S. there's a lot of, you see a lot of the economic schools intentionally target, in particular, the evangelicals because they're, you know, anybody who can believe with absolute certainty that the earth is 6,000 years old because that's what the Bible says. I, I know some of these people that, you know, you cannot dissuade them with science or evidence. Um, so, yeah, they work together. They work together with the major oil producers doing the same thing, treating their populations. And that's scary, because it's the end of the age of reason. It seems we go back and forth between ages of reason and unreason. It's true. It's kind of like always staying yeah. in a camera can't see me. Oh. <laughs> so, one last question. We have um, looked, myself and Anna, have looked into uh, the life and work of Martin Luther King and Gandhi and non-violence as a strategy. Martin Luther King Jr.? Martin Luther King but Jr. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of using soul force to, um, to overcome one's obstacles rather than physical force. Yeah. That being said, I know that on the, um, on the Kaiser Report, occasionally, the lines seem to be blurred between whether or not you're actually calling for capital punishment or violent treatment of uh, these nefarious criminals? Well, in terms of Gandhi or um, you know Martin Luther King Jr., I think there's a time for each of them. If you look at nature, every, everything should reflect na everything reflects nature. We're part of nature. So sometimes soft force happens. The, the, the river flowing gently created the Grand Canyon. You know, and it's a you could create the Grand Canyon using you know, that could also be caused by a mega earthquake that causes massive destruction. Um, and it's, so when he formed, when Max did Karma Bank, that was a soft force that was using a force, a soft force of buying and selling to create change. Um, I, I don't think he's talking uh, literally that we should have hangings of, of bankers, but ending, decapitating, ending that system, cutting off all of these bankers and these fraudsters from our financial system. You'll never, well I think it's beyond even trying to repair this financial system. I think it's, it's, it's gone, it's so toxic and infested. And the mindset, and you see that, like what I was saying about Bitcoin, the mindset of the population is, is, is simpatico with the same fraudsters. People want in on the fraud. That's what they're angry about. They want a cut yeah. of the fraud. That's what um, uh, Bernie Madoff's clients, most of them thought they were, they knew he was a fraudster, but they thought they were not the victim. They didn't know they were the victim. They thought they were perpetrators with them. They thought he had, because he had engineered the um, uh, NASDAQ, that he was like front running and making money. And by the way, just on Friday, the New York Stock Exchange, the first ever fine paid by a, a stock exchange. They basically um, were helping clients front run. So they were giving private clients price information first before the general public. Yeah. That's the opposite of a free market. Yeah. But this is what all of Bernie Madoff's clients thought he was doing. Mm -hmm. So they, yeah. so they wanted they they were like, yeah. As long as we now they're all angry and demanding something be done and telling the government to do something. Yeah. But you know, 
it's that's just, just like <laughs> layer upon layer upon layer of, in, of phantasmagoria. Well, yeah. Because like, as long as I don't perceive myself as being on the receiving end of this injustice, yeah. then okay, fine. But as soon as stuff is missing from my plate, then I get angry. And, um, and I guess it, that comes from the sense of self-importance in an individual uh, sorry, a, a consideration yeah. of self-importance in an individual sort of way as opposed to self-worth within a community, which is something that is sort of ingrained within the general public. Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, in terms of, like, re-engineering the system, a lot of, like, there's certain, you see this, in America it's very apparent, like, the shouting back and forth between the systems. I haven't seen any that's really, um, you know, accounts for all the genuine reality of people on the ground and I see why some people would want hardcore Austrian school because they're you know entrepreneurs and workers and 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 have created something that they think you know might make them rich but you also need artists and and you know people who aren't strive I think a, a society needs people who are just like thinkers and spend all day thinking but if it's it's so tilted against those people that they force to work and work and work and do certain things all day long, I think uh, you know I'm not so sure. We'll see what what happens. Yeah. This, the post collapse. Yeah. You have um. Oh sorry, do you have a question? I just, it's like sort of a follow on yeah. from that. So um, you weren't here for um, yesterday morning, the first talk, were you? No. There was a man called Eli Sklar talking about a moneyless society. Yeah. And um, you were saying, j just now what you were saying reminded me of this, um, well, the kind of, of the tendency that money has to act as a sort of unnecessary medium between a person and their resources, but not just unnecessary, and this is actually kind of, uh, I said this to Max as well, but it's, it's worse than unnecessary, it's worse than useless because it's harming people, because I think when you have money as an incentive, um, then you're incented for working and for producing. Um, and for, you know, as you said, being a thinker, or being an artist, or being just a person of leisure who likes to interact positively with your community, and be beneficial in that kind of relaxed, alternative way. If your motivations for, uh, for doing all of those things are, is fear, fear that you're not going to get food, so, oh, I have to create, or, oh, I have to interact in some way, otherwise I'm not going to get fed, as opposed to, I have to create and I have to interact because I love it. Yeah. Is I mean I think that's hugely, well, um, hugely detrimental to the creative process and to society. And I mean I'd like to know your thoughts on that and your thoughts on. You know, well, I, I like to look society. at history to see what humans do over and over again. And we always have money for the last five thousand years. And men have always it's mostly men got on boats five thousand years ago in China. Half the time they failed to arrive in the Middle East, but that's where the trade route was because they would sink. But it was more dangerous to go overland because there were more, um, you know, bandits out there so to, and steal their goods. And so, you know, for some reason, men still got on boats and sailed to the Middle East, and it would take years. They would leave their families behind and go trade. I don't know why we do it, but we do. <laughs> and, uh, so the real that that's why you know I don't really believe in utopias. I think that you know you have to deal with the reality of how we always behave and what we always do, and we always do trade. We always set out to about what evolution, societal. Yeah, but I'm saying the reality is men will still trade. It does so that those will be the that will be the reality on the ground. Um, but people then always gain power that way because, of course, the guy who happened to own the landing spot, the best landing spot where all the ships came on the ground, got to take a cut of the action and he built and consolidated wealth and empires and would tend to then hand it down to all his children and they had their children and they had a bigger empire to feed like the Saudi kings and all their princes now. And 
it leads to instability and they get decapitated and overthrown and it, well, it's individual self-interest that makes you know it was in Marie Antoinette's self-interest to live in the castle and, and, and eat well while the peasants weren't but eventually you know it, it made sense for her to continue living as she did but not in the long term for that day you know obviously she lost her head but you know that's what we're saying is like it, it, it doesn't matter what you do this is what will happen because that tends to be the historical cycle yeah. history just repeats itself yeah. you're just saying what will happen it might be tomorrow it could be next year or 10 years or 20 years but at the current sort of system and it's getting so blatant look I mean the New York Stock Exchange, basically, they didn't have to admit guilt, but they've been front allowing certain people to front run the market since 2008. They paid a $5 million fine. Who knows how many billions, hundreds of billions or trillions have been confiscated this way, stolen, but, you know, people will start to, yeah. this injustice is what, uh, that's what happens though. You know, the guy who has the best property because all the boats have to land there to get to Cairo to sell their goods, you know. He, uh, What's it going to take to break the cycle? It might have to be aliens. <laughs> teach us something. And then they'll become corrupt. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll have to overthrow them. <laughs> I guess my last question is, it seems like week in, week out, you and Max come with a lot of energy and a lot of jokes and smiles. What's your formula? How do you keep, is it goji berries or you meditate or <laughs> Well, Max is naturally funny. You know, he was a comedian first. Yeah, he was uh, that's comedian. that's the uh, funny thing is he's uh, he's naturally funny, he, and yeah. it's it's gallows humor, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. It's uh, it, it's not <laughs> so joyful to know everything is being defrauded. But at this point, uh, I think it's a little bit more positive because it's so it's so blatant. The crimes are so blatant, people know and understand this. I think it's pretty general understanding of this, and I think that's where new things will come from. Yeah. It could, well, it's obviously bloody. I mean, look around the world. I mean, the right here in London, it's not, but in Athens it is, and Spain yeah. it is, and the Middle East it is. You yeah. know, they're, they're, you know, we've, we've lived a very sheltered life. Yeah, true. You know, my whole life has been pretty much during the it's been a bull market in the dollar and bonds and and you know a bit more turmoil starts to happen during these uh, collapse times so yeah. who knows I'm kind of ready I'm a little bit nervous <laughs> I think it could be pretty scary at yeah. times you know I was there in Athens I mean, we were there in Tahrir Square as well yeah. Athens was scarier yeah. that was a that was scarier to me, I guess, because it's more, they're more similar to I am, and I saw uh, rage like I've never seen before. So it's revolutionary. That's what I imagine the peasants in the squares outside of uh, you know Versailles looks like. Yeah. So there, I saw in their eyes that there's no going back. Like there's a thing that kind of breaking point where you just become a surge of revolution. Yeah, and it's not just young people though, it's like, yeah. I, I remember sitting with this 70 year old woman, like dressed in a nice little, look, like a Chloe or yeah. Chanel type outfit, and she was talking about yeah. that she has guns at home and she was going to go, you know, from the, during the times of the Civil War and, and the, the, the military rule. You know, she was like, she was ready to go take on the government, and you're like, <laughs> this yeah. is like, <laughs> that's when you know it's like, it's dangerous times. Yeah. But I, I get worried there again, it's that, that fascist sort of group, Golden Dawn. Yeah, yeah. Is, um, but, you know, those are the sort of things, what's happened is the cash money is not flowing yeah. that way, it's flowing out. And there's a void there, and into that void steps, you know, somebody with simple answers.